Hello and welcome to today's OATLA webinar titled Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. My name is Natasha Aziz and I'm pleased to host today's program featuring Jasmine Dea from Fireman Dea & Co and Audrey Ramsey from Blue & Dunn LLP. Attendees will receive 1.25 EDI professionalism hours for today's webinar. I'm pleased to introduce our speakers for today. Jasmine Dea is the Managing Principal of Fireman Dea & Co. She graduated from Queen's University in 2005 with a Bachelor of Laws. After completion of the Bar Admissions course and exams, Jasmine commenced her articles in 2005 under Jack Fireman and was admitted to the Law Society of Ontario in 2006. Jasmine graduated from Osgood Hall in 2009 with a Master of Laws. Jasmine practices in all areas of personal injury, however, she focuses on claims involving minors, club assaults, cyberbullying, elder abuse, and motor vehicle claims involving catastrophic impairment. Outside of work, Jasmine is a big advocate for work-life balance. She hosts the site JD in the Kitchen, which provides simple recipes, tips, and tricks for balancing a busy lifestyle, and has also recently released a cookbook. Our second speaker, Audrey Ramsey, was called to the Ontario Bar in 1995. She received an Honours Bachelor of Arts degree from Wilfrid Laurier University in 1989 and her Bachelor of Laws degree from Ottawa University in 1993. Since her call to the Bar, she has handled a broad range of insurance defence work including property and casualty, professional negligence, commercial and automobile insurance. Audrey is involved in a number of professional organizations and has served as a member of the Ontario Bar Association Board of Directors, Chair of Professional Development, Public Affairs Liaison on the Insurance Law Executive, Member of OBA Council and Chair of Council Forum at the Financial Services Commission of Ontario, among many others. Outside of work, Audrey enjoys traveling, spending time with family and friends, and getting involved in charitable organizations. Ladies, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having us today. Uh, we're here to talk about the topic of equality, diversity, and inclusion. Um, I'm here with Audrey Ramsey, uh, who is joining us, and it's great to have her with Ola uh, because she is an insurance defense lawyer. Um, and as you know, I'm Jasmine Dea. So before we get started on the topic at hand, um, I did want to tell a little story about something that happened yesterday. I was at an examination for discovery with uh, two lawyers, and one of the lawyers there uh, was a little more junior than me. She uh, had been practicing for about uh, five or six years, and I was telling her that I needed to go and prepare for this webinar, um, and uh, we were talking about the necessity of, of getting this new credit, uh, but putting that aside, I was telling her I remember not too long ago when uh, CPD became mandatory. And she was shocked that at one point it wasn't mandatory. And so we had some fun discussing that. And I, I told her that my superior at the time, when it became mandatory, um, I was in my first few years of practice and he was grumbling and saying, you know, with all of his years of experience, shouldn't he be grandfathered in? And I explained to him that I was quite sure that that was not possible, but he demanded that I do research to see how the CPD credit could be satisfied because surely he should be grandfathered in and couldn't I just file an exemption form with the Law Society and this sort of went back and forth and uh, he basically at the end just told me to take care of it and now he's retired so it's fine. It was taken care of and he satisfied his CPD. Um, Audrey, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about when that happened. Well, I mean, uh, memory being foggy, I do remember a huge battle um, uh, end of 2010, uh, 2011, as uh, there was consultation by the Law Society, uh, by various stakeholders as to um, whether or not to make um, CPD mandatory. I also particularly remember it because Carol Brown at the time was the president of um, the uh, Ontario Bar Association. Um, I do know that after she was appointed, she was appointed in 2011, um, CPD became mandatory. And there was a, a big push, as, as Jasmine says, to see whether or not uh, and how um, lawyers could be exempt. And I think the Law Society has over time 
worked on trying to carve out some space um, for lawyers. Um, for example, the the uh, fact that you you don't have to um, be uh, with someone all the time to to get those those particular credits um, and the different ways that you can satisfy the substantive element. So yes, it's it's been a long battle, but um, it's here and it's. Uh, uh, apparently supposed to make us better lawyers. <laughs> and so now fast forward, uh, we're now in 2018, and we have the Law Society imposing a new requirement on us, and that is with respect to equality, diversity, and inclusion. And we'll go into what exactly is required of licensees with these new rules uh, a little later in the presentation. but. What I do want to say at this point is we're hearing all the grumbling again. And I'll be the first to admit that I too was grumbling and sort of still grumbling because admittedly, I don't know how beneficial this new rule is going to be. Um, I, I feel that the Law Society uh, has good intention, uh, but I don't believe that forcing licensees, being lawyers and paralegals, to take uh, some time out of their schedules to uh, take CPD on equality, diversity, and inclusion is going to change very much. And I, I've mentioned to Ramsey, uh, sorry, Audrey Ramsey, uh, who's sitting with me right now, um, in preparation of today's presentation, I said, you know, I just don't see how a racist is going to listen to me and speak for an hour and not be a, ra a racist. Or I don't see how a man who feels that it's just fine that only one quarter of partners at law firms are female, you know, that's okay. Uh, it, it, it's quite outrageous to me, but uh, I don't feel that this man who feels this way, and I'm not saying every man feels this way, obviously, but there are some, and I don't feel that that's really going to change, that listening to me for an hour is going to change that outlook, um, or if someone has an issue with uh, someone's sexual orientation. How is listening to me speak for an hour about how they shouldn't do that, um, how's that gonna change their opinion, especially when they're forced to take something? But regardless of the fact that I don't believe that forcing licensees to take this credit is going to change very much, I do believe that it's important to talk about these issues, to keep it relevant, to keep opening our eyes to the fact that these are legitimate problems that need to be addressed. So in that way, although it's irritating uh, that it's sort of being forced on us, there is some benefit, and um, you know, let's get started and keep the conversation going to try and make a difference. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, just uh, 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 to jump off on um, Jasmine's point, um, I, I, I come at it, uh, at it from the perspective of um, I, I do understand that um, some people may um, grumble about the administrative requirements, and I do understand. The, the valid debate that's being had right now as to whether or not the Law Society has um, a jurisdiction to um, uh, Im impose um, uh, it, it's, I'm not saying it's you because of, but you, you can say that if you read the article by Conrad Black, uh, it's sort of like a particular perspective and some of what Jasmine is, is saying, uh, echoed in, in some of his articles. But I, I um, whether or not the, your regulator has the right to say to you, um, you have the right, to, you must promote diversity and inclusion um, in all its means, um, because uh, already in the state, uh, in, in the rules of professional conduct, if you look at the commentary, they're already required to do that. The big um, change, um, as I see it, in which uh, has people. Um, grumbling, never mind the statement of principles itself that one has to adopt, is the, is the use of the word promote, and I think a lot of you may be aware of the constitutional challenge by Professor Ryan Halford. And I, I allow people their view, but what I see here is that the Law Society is saying we need to have a cultural shift, we need to have this, uh, this discussion going in, and I think when Jasmine talks about some, uh, later on some of the, the, her experience and so on, um, we may have that debate as to whether or not ultimately requiring um, uh, lawyers to um, have an equality, diversity, and inclusion credit will move towards, um, uh, you know, um, uh, having this uh, 
cultural shift uh, that, I, that I think the law society has talked about. Uh, so with that, let's look at how this all arose. Uh, the Law Society had a working group called Challenges Faced by Racialized Licensees Working Group. They prepared a report titled Working Together for Change, Strategies to Address Issues of Systemic Racism in the Legal Profession. Uh, from that report came 13 recommendations, which we will discuss in more detail uh, shortly. Um, the report was formally approved by convocation in December 2016. And uh, Audrey, tell us where we are now. In terms of the report? Yes. Um, what I can say is that uh, the benchers voted um, uh, last year to adopt the um, recommendations and the challenges report. And, and uh, out, of, out of that um, came um, some pushback with respect to the um, uh, one of the recommendations uh, that is being the the uh, the requirement the mandatory requirement of each and every lawyer or licensee I should say to adopt their own um, statement of principle and um, I, I think we're as we we go through what's required what was required in 2017 2018. Uh, 2020 and beyond, um, we'll see that uh, essentially the Law Society, and I know I'm jumping ahead, has um, uh, looked at the recommendations by the challenge in the challenges report and, and said uh, these are the things that we can move forward with in order to, as they say, have that cultural shift and, and change the, uh, the, the, the landscape and how licensees deal with the public uh, society at, uh, at large um, and um, and um, other lawyers um, and the administration of justice. So um, th that's where we are. We're we're on the uh, 2017 was was year one, and I think um, there there is a, there were a lot of grumblings as um, people. I think at the, by March of of this year, you had to have. Um, uh, certified in your annual report that you uh, uh, adopted, you have adopted your own statement of principle. Um, uh, Jasmine, stop me if I'm rushing ahead, but mm -hmm. but if you're um, a firm with um, license, uh, ten or more licensees, you had to have a diversity and inclusion manual, um, and the law society has uh, various requirements that's required in that that that. Um, uh, manual and uh, it is very strict. There is a there is a template online. Um, similarly, for the the statement of principles, there are, they they have two templates online which you can adopt because they as your own because they they incorporate um, uh, what the law society requires of each of us as licensees. Um, so I just want to take it back to this this name that I guess I, I qualify under. When did I become a racialized licensee? Uh, so I know that uh, uh, Jasmine, you and I had a discussion beforehand, and you uh, you had um, a, 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 an issue with that term racialized licensees, and you're not the only one. I've, I've heard it before, and I, and I know that initially when I heard that term, I, I had uh, a similar reaction. But, you know, I did um, have an opportunity um, a year or so ago as the debate raged to speak to then venture jo um, Joanne St. Louis, who um, uh, some of you may, may know her. She's a professor at the University of Ottawa. Um, an author and, and um, uh, was a bencher a couple of decades ago and came up with this term while re, uh, research. Um, and um, so uh, uh, the, the term um, that uh, is supposed to capture um, certain characteristics and, and demographics, and I'm not a, a sociologist or, or <laughs> I'm not a professor, so uh, you know, I've, I've adopted or acclimatized to the to the to the term, um, but uh, I, I I do hear um, the the arguments on the other side. 
So because people can't see us, um, maybe, I don't know if you saw our pictures, but we're not white. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, I've, I've been, I was born in Toronto. I lived in uh, Toronto and Victoria growing up. And aside from doing four years of undergrad in the U.S., I've been in Canada. And I've never thought of myself as part of some different group, thankfully. Um, I view myself as Canadian. And when the law society is trying to help promote um, or, or break down barriers and promote diversity and equality, and then they, they term people uh, that fit into these different characteristics, I take issue. I'm not happy about it. I mean, I'm one voice, and it, I just, I don't, I don't like it. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> Yeah, so um, and I and I and I hear that, and I and I think um, there is there is uh, still probably then debate to be had about um, uh, the use of the term racialized licensees. I I've, I've gotten used to it, and um, um, I don't uh, take an issue with it per se. But I can understand. Um, it's just, and I'm going to throw this out there. It's just like when people started to use the word. African in front of American and a Canadian. My friends who were truly from Africa would get upset, <laughs> you know. And, and I, it's it's labeling is 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 always a controversial um, uh, topic. <laughs> well, for sure, especially when I view those segregations and labels more as, um, you know, things that are discussed a lot with every statistic possible. Uh, when it comes to south of the border, um, you know, that's that's where I view racialized licensee is not here. <laughs> so if the law society people are listening, I'm not happy. I don't like it. Jasmine is not happy. Not happy. <laughs> um, okay, so putting that aside, let's turn to the recommendations. So there's 13 recommendations. They're on my slide. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, but in the report, they expand on each of these recommendations. Um, do you want to speak about these a bit? Um, the the only ones I, I want to sort of like tease out, um, for example, um, uh, recommendation um, uh, nine, which is why we are here today. The requirement that uh, uh, each licensee um, uh, do uh, a, a program or obtain uh, its quality, diversity, and inclusion credit. And you will know that um, you would have received some emails that by 2020 you will will have had to have accumulated three um, credits. And and after 2020, so by 2021, every year thereafter you have to, or three hours, sorry, um, uh, after 2020. Uh, um, you will have to acquire one hour a year. And um, that is, maybe this is not the, 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 the appropriate uh, webinar to say, hey, you're going to be excited about doing this in the future, but this is just a teaser to tell you what's out there and, and what you're required to do. There are very, there are, I'm going to say I did a program in June um, for the Canadian defense lawyers, and we had uh, a wonderful um, um, panel, and the feedback was tremendous um, from the attendees there, some of whom were from the states as well. So listen, it's it's required now. Don't shoot the messenger. Um, we we got to get on board. So so that's um, recommendation number nine. One of the other ones that I, I, I want to um, uh, look at is leading by example, and, I, and I, ha I have to say to you, if you go in and Google legal leaders for diversity, you'll see that over a hundred or so um, big corporations have signed what they call a statement of support for diversity and inclusion by General Counsel in Canada. And these are your potential clients and um, uh, potential um, um, uh, friends, colleagues, and whatever. And I'll, I'll just say some of the big ones, Sun Life Financial, RBC, Deloitte, Bombardier, TDBC, Ford, Bell, Bruce Power, Cineplex, just Google it. 
Um, I, I can also tell you that um, a law firm, there's a law firm diversity network um, as well, and there, if you Google that, you'll see um, that the, the law firm diversity and inclusion network includes um, some of the big firms because they are committed to this. And you know why they're committed to this? Because it makes business sense for them to do this. Their clients are demanding in their RFPs or um, that they, they show, have actual data to show that uh, they are keeping up um, in terms of uh, um, uh, certain measurements. And there, there are objective ways to measure whether or not they're they're keeping up. For example, the National Association of Law Placement or NALP statistics, and there's also a vault um, survey which measures the law firm demographic profile. So um, these law firms are uh, getting on board because their clients are demanding that they, they get on board. Uh, we'll come back to that um, afterwards. So those are the some of the ones that I want to te uh, tease out. And the building commit communities of support. That, I mean, I, I'm going to leave um, Jasmine to talk about that a little bit, but one of the things that the Law Society has suggested in terms of when you build your manual um, or, or put together your 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 own um, office manual uh, and when you do your recruiting and so on, they suggest that you reach out to, you know, um, diverse communities and associations and they have um, suggestions on how to do that. You know, there is a uh, an organization or association called the Round um, Table of Diversity Associations, and you can look at all the different associations that that um, belong to that. If you're looking to hire, maybe you should ask them to post or or um, uh, you know um, see whether or not they they have anyone that you, you can. Uh, recruits uh, there, that are that are looking. So you don't post in the traditional um, ways, and you don't recruit in the, the traditional ways, and it, it goes on. <laughs> but I'm looking at uh, the papers that Audrey has referenced. So one is Law Firm Diversity and Inclusion Network, and there's various signatories to the Statement of Principles. And then we have Legal Leaders of Diversity, a support of a statement of support for diversity and inclusion by general counsel in Canada. And I think that this is fantastic. But when I look here, I see that all the firms are big firms. And when I, correct me if I'm wrong. And when I, when I look at uh, the legal leaders for diversity, when I look here, we have companies, again, big. We've got TD, the Home Depot, uh, Toyota, BDO, Terra, uh, et cetera. And, and that's fantastic. And that's why we need to get this conversation going, but, because it needs to. Yeah, it, it definitely <laughs> needs to trickle into, you know, the legal practice. I'm not saying it doesn't, but what about my firm? My firm, you know, we're a small firm. I'm not a big corporation. Maybe in my mind sometimes I am, but, uh, <laughs> you know, in reality, <laughs> uh, I can recognize reality, and I recognize that we're not, we're not RBC. So... Uh, well, you know, does the law society have the ability? I mean, they do, but is it? Should I have to do a statement of principle? Should I have to look at these websites to hire and and you know? Uh, no, I, I mean, what the law society is saying is actually, you know, there is there is a passive requirement that we that we abide by um, the. Uh, Human Rights um, Code, and, and that we respect uh, 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 people of, you know, um, all gender, um, uh, uh, sexual orientation. Um, it, you know, I, I don't want to. Uh, it's not only 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 women, but um, the the requirement that we um, annually consciously at least, I, I understand for a small firm, consciously um, think about what our obligations are or duties are to the, to the profession and to the society. Um, perhaps uh, the hope is that uh, that will help us <laughs> as we move forward. Um, and I, I say that um, 
I, it's good to have a voice that says, why do I have to, and qu to question? Because we have to continually question, mm -hmm. right? And we'll see what happens on the other side when the constitutional challenge is heard. I know that the RODA um, is, um, I mentioned the Round Table of Diversity Associations has applied for intervener status. And what is their I, position? Um, RODA. And what's their position with respect to these, these changes? This report. They support the report. Okay. They support the statement of principles. I know that the um, Canadian uh, Defense um, has also applied for intervener status, and I don't don't know whether or not that's been consented to. So um, and what's their uh, again, they right. support exactly, and so you uh, they do. And and when the statement of principles was being challenged there uh, last year. Um, there are a lot of stakeholders who wrote in um, their, uh, to, to advise of their position, and I think, I, 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 I know specifically one, and I won't mention which association um, was opposed to it, but I think there were, but I think there were two. All the rest supported, supported the adoption of the statement of principles, but I, I must say that I, I listened to the vote live, and not all the, the ventures um, supported a statement of principles, and and they 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 have their reasons, and we can't say that those reasons aren't aren't valid. Mm -hmm. Who am I to say? Right? For sure. Yeah. Well, I think that now that there is this report, it's very unpopular to to take a position that runs contrary to it. But but if we if we uh, and I I don't remember the 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 numbers, but I I'm going to, I I should have boned up on this. But the, the report was adopted initially, uh, and, uh, and it was unanimous. There were two ab ab abstentions, the challenges report. Um, the statement of principles that caused an issue, that was a separate um, um, thing. So uh, the, the venture support, the challenges report, okay. yes. <laughs> so it's, it's, okay. um, that's, that's, the, there's no debate about that. <laughs> okay, well that's good. Um, all right, so let's turn to specifically what do licensees need to do in 2018? So it is September, yeah. and uh, I don't know when our webinar is going to be live, but uh, you've well, got a few months to finish these uh, credits um, or credits. So it says begin to meet the requirements for three CPD professionalism hours focused on equality, diversity, and inclusion. Those will be known as EDI hours. Uh, you must continue to meet the statement of principles requirement, continue to meet the human rights and diversity policy requirement. So the statement of principles, um, this goes back to a small firm situation. Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, Audrey, but the statement of principles uh, needs to be prepared by law firms that have, you know? So the statement of principles is a document that each licensee prepares, and it is mandatory, and that's the thing that okay. caused the controversy. That's what I mean, though. But it's only—it's not for every firm. It's for every licensee, so it doesn't matter, regardless of uh, every licensee has to 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 um, adopt a statement of principle, and um, or the statement of principles. And the law society has assisted by providing two templates. So. We, we have to carve that out separately. And this, and I can tell you that the Law Society has, has um, um, increased its, its uh, um, enforcement arm. They have increased the number of staff. And right now, there is no um, disciplinary act, and I should probably be saying this, that, that attaches because uh, as people mull over um, whether how the law society is going to enforce it. So, but you should, as of the last um, annual report that you completed, you should have somewhere on your on your system saved in your law society file with your annual report. Uh, even if the if it's the law society's template, and they do give you um, two different versions, and you can review them and adopt it completely as your own. Um, a statement of principle, which I've adopted one of the law societies with minor changes, and I've signed it, and it's in my folder. 
<laughs> just okay. in case they, so, they audit you. I think we need to tease this out just a little bit more because I have created some confusion possibly. So the statement of principles that there's a, there's two templates as, as Audrey mentioned. It is on the Law Society website, and if you if you go there, there's PDF documents actually that you can look at, download, etc. Um, and so yes, that's for every licensee. But then um, we have here the adoption of statement of principles and creation of a human rights slash diversity policy for workplaces of ten or more licensees. So the, the so separate the statement of principles out as one item. Okay. And that's mandatory for every licensee. Okay. Then the other is the adoption of the human rights diversity policy. I kept seeing a manual, but that's what I mean because I had to create a manual because we had like a 10 or more licensees, i.e. lawyers practicing at our firm. So um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a, a, a document that a firm will have to prepare. And if your corporation and corporations um, have the same obligations. And I do know that um, I went to um, um, an event where their uh, uh, corporate counsel represented, and they were talking about the fact that in corporations, not, uh, you know, some people may be lawyers and some may not be. And so, how do we, how do they fashion that? But they too have to adopt um, a human rights and diversity policy consistent with what the law society requires, regardless of what their corporate policy requires from um, um, an HR standpoint. So, yes. So when I'm looking at these templates, just so people out there, if you're not able to look at these templates while you're listening to us. <laughs> um, so template one is, this is for the statement of principles that every licensee must prepare. Uh, so template one is, it says a few things. I'm just gonna read it briefly. Uh, this is the template. As a licensee of the Law Society of Upper Canada, I stand by the following principles. Number one, a recognition that the Law Society is committed to inclusive legal workplaces in Ontario, a reduction of barriers created by racism, unconscious bias and discrimination, and better representation of Indigenous and racial, racialized licensees in the legal professions in all legal workplaces and at all levels of seniority. Number two, my special responsibility as a member of the legal profession to protect the dignity of all individuals and to respect human rights laws in force in Ontario. Number three, a commitment to advance reconciliation, acknowledging that we are all collectively responsible to support improved relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in Ontario and Canada. And number four, an acknowledgement of my obligation to promote equality, diversity, and inclusion generally and in my behavior towards colleagues, employees, clients, and the public. So by printing this off and keeping it on my computer or in a file in my office, is that supposed to help me? Well, and, and so that's, that's the question that um, some, um, some people have asked, and, and it's uh, obviously a valid question. I mean, it's a valid question because uh, people who are reluctant and who are being, being pulled along or they're just going to probably do it because it's mandatory and then and put it down in their, their little electronic folder and then, then leave it alone. But I think, I think um, the discussion has gotten beyond uh, any one particular individual. As you see um, what the, uh, the corporate, uh, well, corporations are demanding, your clients are demanding. Uh, and so regardless of whether or not uh, uh, any one licensee believes in um, these principles, right, they're being pushed along. And, and um, I'm sure that um, whatever their views are, um, I'm not going to say anyone that one is, is uh, uh, objecting to it because of any um, ill feelings or whatever it may be that they don't want to be, be uh, further regulated, but I, the, the fact that you have to read this and look at it and, you know, and, and be part of the discussion and the dialogue, uh, one would hope. <laughs> but could this not be part of our call to the bar ceremony for all newcomers, or do you think this will be beneficial for us practicing lawyers? 
Well, so the statement of principle, there's only one piece, right? And so, and, and so we've, we've gone through, and you've done a thorough job in going through some of the, the items that, the, 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 uh, that were recommended, and we teased out some of the, the items, and we see that regardless of what the law society is doing, society is actually probably ahead. And by the way, south of the border, despite what we think is going on there, mm -hmm. they're even further ahead than we are, <laughs> right? So, so um, despite what we may think of what the law society is trying to do, it seems that around the law society, there are other players who are forcing them along. By the way, Facebook, for example, um, says that um, uh, it will, I just want to just, uh, Facebook is pushing its external law firms to become more diverse. Hewlett Packard is doing the same and withholding fees from some firms. The big, Fortune Big 500 companies are, are demanding diversity and inclusion. Um, but, and sometimes I'm going to say this, the default is to say gender diversity. And I, and I sit on a, a, a the International Association of Defense Council, not that I, I should uh, signal or pick them up, but like some of the, uh, sometimes we're trying to plan program and, and the folks are from all around the world. And the default is gender diversity. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I, I obviously, mm -hmm. maybe it's not obvious to everyone, but obviously to me, I believe that there does need to be diversity in the workplace because it's a better representation of society. And it enables us to open our minds to think about things that maybe we wouldn't um, because we're not thinking like, I'm not thinking like a man or I'm not thinking like a person with disabilities or I'm not thinking in those ways. So I think it's really helpful to, to have diversity in, white, in, in the workplace for sure. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sold on, on certain aspects of these recommendations. But let's turn to uh, 2019 and what the requirements are. We've done 2018. Requirements of licensees in 2019. Uh, licensee representative of legal workplaces of 10 or more licensees to complete and quality diversity and inclusion self-assessment for their legal workplace through the 2018 annual report. And I think we touched on that. Um, and all licensees will be asked to voluntarily answer inclusion questions about their legal workplace in their 2018 annual report. Um, so, so um, uh, if we can tease that out, um, yeah, so the continuing requirement with respect to the EDI credit, um, the uh, fact that, and this is not mandatory, as you said, uh, but the uh, voluntary um, survey. Um, that you uh, that you identified, um, and you you know um, to get a chance to look at what's been happening in in your firm since uh, 2017, and and do a it's a pause, it's a check, and and I it, it's it's an, uh, I, I think that's one of the things that the recommendations included, and an opportunity to reassess and. Uh, you would be able to then at that time, Jasmine, determine whether or not some of this stuff that's required, the statement of principles, is it working? Is it, you know, is it making my colleague or my colleagues or my friends annoyed and upset? Is there... Well, I don't see how hitting prints is going to, you know, cause too much issue for that. <laughs> yeah. But, um, so, uh, yeah, so it's, the, the, it's continued... Uh, um, uh, a push towards um, making licensees think about these issues, but actually doing instead of just um, talking about it. Mm -hmm. So requirements of licensees by 2020, uh, the goal is for three CPD professional hours focused on equality, diversity, and inclusion um, to have been completed by the end of 2020. So we're brought up to speed by that point. That's correct. So if you've been listening to this webinar, this webinar should count towards um, uh, that, uh, that credit, that EDI credit. Um, whatever the assignment in terms of um, EDI credit, you can use that credit towards the, uh, the 2020 um, um, 
EBI cumulative total of three hours that you have to meet by that time. Okay. Now, Audrey's not too excited, I think, about my next slide. Um, Why? What is it? <laughs> <laughs> so, personal experiences. Um, I will start, and you can think about what you're going to say on this one. Um, I, I feel incredibly blessed to say that um, you know, I graduated law school in 2005 and started working for uh, two gentlemen, um, Jack Fireman and Bill Wolf, and uh, they, they did not seem to have an issue about the fact that I was um, a different color than them or that I was female. Um, you know, Jack was hard on me, but I think that's just his nature, and it shaped me to be the lawyer I am today. I think he's hard on everybody, or he was, uh, before his retirement. And if anyone of you knows Bill, Bill Wolf is kind and calm and collected. And if anything, I would get annoyed with him because his level of organization was not in line with my borderline OCD, and he would accept that. <laughs> so uh, both great gentlemen to work for. And I did not have issues within the firm, thankfully. Um, but I recognize that that's not always the case. And I recognize that, unfortunately, some of my colleagues have felt very discriminated against, um, whether it was because they were female or because of their race or religion or whatever the case may be. Um, and it's unfortunate. Um, I do feel that where I can relate is, is that when I was when I was young, when I was uh, in my mind, I'm still very young, but <laughs> again, we touch on reality and recognize that may not be the case. Uh, so you know, when I first started out, it was. Um, maybe not. It was it was the way I looked young. I was I was fresh at a law school, and I felt that there was a lot of bullies out there. I would go to discovery, and if a defense lawyer on the other side, particularly an older male, uh, you know, became aggressive, um, it would make me feel really uncomfortable, and I felt like I couldn't say very much. Uh, you know, now one of those same gentlemen tries it, they're going to get it right back for me, so they know better, but uh, unfortunately that wasn't always the case. And I've heard a lot of stories about young people um, having that same situation. And so while I can't necessarily relate to having issues because of my gender and race, I do know what it feels like when you're discriminated against in the legal profession, and it's not, it's not nice and it's not the way it should be. Yeah, um, Jasmine, I I don't know why you thought it would would not like you like that. Um, oh, I wasn't sure. sure. Okay. Um, because you know, similar to you, I I had uh, the same experience. I mean, I don't um, recall um, having an instance where I would say that um, I was discriminated against um, in my practice because. Of my race, I, I um, would would say that um, some of the stories I've uh, I've heard since, um, in terms of uh, things that were done when I went to court or when I went to a discovery, similar amount to women, <laughs> for example, being being mistaken for the clerk or being asked if you're the clerk or uh, when you're at a discovery, um, uh, being asked if you're the court reporter or um, paralegal or whatnot. I've had uh, those women uh, tell me those stories as well. So I think it's, it's a, a story about women as opposed to a story about, about race. And, and you can see that we're still going through a cultural shift despite the fact that women 50% of, of, of people who are graduating are women, right? We're still going through those changes, those long changes. And, and what I'll say is this, maybe also it's part of my makeup that I don't really assume or presume that um, if people are treating me or saying something to me, it's because of my race or my skin color or whatever. I just, maybe they're an idiot, <laughs> right? No, but uh, so I don't, I don't attribute bad motives um, to 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 people generally, because sometimes people are just having a bad day, right? And so, and I'll back up and say this: that doesn't necessarily mean that, as you said, that there there are not people who have experienced these things and who have real stories to tell. And depending on their environment, or who have felt alienated and isolated, and 
and not able to share because at the time maybe there 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 was a less opportunity to share than there there is now and and that's also part of one of the the good thing about things about having this discussion and the good thing about what the law society is trying to do in terms of the cultural shift and maybe people feel bombarded and inundated by all the media attention to this but it has opened up a dialogue it's opened up the opportunity for people who feel that they're being being um, discriminated against if and if that those are valid complaints claims that they can bring it to a partner or a colleague in, in whatever and and have those issues addressed as opposed to uh, leaving the firm or leaving whatever the uh, the corporate environment or whatever the the situation may be um, that uh, that this behavior is occurring in. Uh, I mean, um, I, I'll be quick about this, but I mean, I've heard stories of women who are really powerful women right now who tell me that they used to go to court and they would have to change because the judge would say to them, not like what they're wearing. These things happen, right? Mm -hmm. Or not, not um, hear them because they were wearing pants. These things used to happen, and see. I that talked to someone recently, and they they thought I was making it up about the pants thing because yeah. I remember when I first started, uh, there were certain proceedings I would go to, and I was wearing skirts because I knew the lawyer was on the other side, and they were older, and they would expect me in a skirt. Yeah. And and see, these things these things happen. I have a potential client who spoke to me about. Um, geez, it's just a, a, a situation, and I want a situation that just would be so hard to believe um, in 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 this day and age. Jasmine, can uh, I tell my story? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, um, although I haven't had you know too many issues in the city, uh, in the first few years of, of practice, when I was a young, excited associate. I was sent all over Ontario to all these small towns that no one else wanted to go to. And I was very excited to go because one, that was my job. And two, I got to go to court. Um, but there were some small towns when I would show up, I suddenly would feel very uncomfortable because people were staring at me. And I didn't at first understand why I thought, oh, it's because I'm from the city and this is a small town and realized that that wasn't actually the case. I think they were staring at me because I wasn't white. And it made me feel really uncomfortable. And even to this day, when I see that I have proceedings in certain places, my first thought is that memory of when I went there years ago and how people stared at me. Um, and it's like as if you have something in your teeth and people are staring at you and not saying anything to you. Um, so I did encounter that. and. Uh, one court in particular, and in presentation, in, in preparation for today's webinar, I was trying to rack my brain, trying to remember where I was, uh, but it's been over a decade, and it sort of escaped me. I guess it wasn't so important, but uh, there was one courthouse that I went to where I didn't know uh, where the robing room was, and I asked, and um, I was told, well, the women don't have a room, because I saw a robing room for men. Mm -hmm. I saw that, so the plaque on outside a room, um, and I saw the washroom, one for men, one for women, and I was told, told the women don't have one. And I, I said, well, where should I change? And they said, the women use the washroom. And I'm like, okay. And I didn't think much of it until I walked into the washroom. And it was disgusting. I don't, you know, I think the last time it was renovated was the 70s. So it was, it was already old and disgusting. I don't know when it was cleaned. It definitely had a foul odor that, you know, is in my memory bank. Um, and I was trying to change without touching anything. Um, and then, you know, when I did my motion. Now, it was an uncontested motion. But when I was reflecting for today, I was thinking to myself, what if that happened now? And what if, um, you know, I had a contested motion against counsel and my, my first thoughts and feelings were, why do I have this crappy little bathroom to change in? And that man sitting across from me has this gorgeous robing room plus the washroom. Uh, well, it probably wasn't gorgeous, but still, you know, he had space to change. And, and that's how, how is that an even playing field? I'm going to advocate for my client that I was put into these substandard conditions while he didn't have to be put in those same conditions. Um, arguably, I wonder if I asked him if I could use the change room, he would have said, sorry, he probably would have said, sure. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not fair. Why, why do we have to have these conditions? 
Uh, why do we have to start on an un unlevel playing field? Um, it's, it's, an, it's an unfortunate reality, and I, I don't think it's one that should exist. So I want to continue about the importance of the, the discussion that we're having and how it frees um, people to be their, their, their themselves. And, and so, I mean, uh, and we all have friends who have had experiences that, yes, we, we haven't shared those experiences, but, you know, they, they've not been able to live their, their complete lives until certain things have moved and the needle has moved. And so uh, you have another story to share. <laughs> yes, I do. So, I mean, this topic of equality, diversity, and inclusion, it's not just about race. We've talked already a little bit about gender. I think it includes people with disabilities. It in, involves the LGBTQ community. Um, I have a very good friend, and I can't say much about him because he will kill me, but he is a very close friend of mine, and I know him actually from friends outside of law. And he has become a close friend as both a lawyer friend and a friend outside of law. And every time we would have um, outside of law gathering so there was a dinner party or a barbecue or a pool party uh, he would bring his boyfriend and uh, you know whenever we were going to a law event like um, end of term dinner he would always text me before and say remember not to say something don't say anything remember just a reminder because he hadn't come out yet and he is a lawyer on Bay Street and he was really concerned about moving up in the ranks if they knew that he was gay because he knew that there was certain there were certain people um, that just would not accept him for who he was and he did not want to jeopardize his ability to move up the ranks. Um, he is now open, I believe. I don't work in the same firm as him, but I'm pretty sure he is. Uh, and he's an incredible guy, an incredible mind. Um, he's recognized by people for his attributes in the legal profession. I won't say too much more about him because, I, again, I don't want him to come after me for this, but um, it's unfortunate that some people feel that they can't be themselves in our profession. Thank you. Um, and, you know, and so despite the, you know, we may challenge the way our regulator is going about this, or some may, I should say, and that it's good to have these debates. I mean, I think that's, that's that's one of the stories that um, um, say to you, that's why this is important to have this discussion. That's why it's important to remind people what their, their obligations and duties are as citizens of this country. Um, so it's not only passively um, accepting, but it's also promoting because, for example, if you can um, mentor and sponsor people who you know have been historically disadvantaged or who you know who were um, or having challenges for people in the LGBTQ community who have been, um, uh, it, it's been uh, difficult uh, for them to be uh, some, of my, like my friends, to, to come out and to be open. Um, then you know that this is an important discussion. And so it may be for us, um, we might think, why are we having this discussion? We're, we're who we are. But for some, it's an important discussion because there's uh, still a ways to go, right? Yeah, and I don't I, disagree. I don't disagree. And I definitely think keeping the conversation going is key to reminding people because I think in some situations, uh, going back to my friend and his firm, I think that for some people, um, they don't even realize, they don't realize that they are treating people in this manner and sometimes talking about it reminds them and, and makes them say, oh, did I just do that? Did I just put someone down? Did I just talk to that female that way? Did I treat someone different because he's gay? You know, and I think that by talking about it, definitely it's helpful. Yeah. We could turn to the statistics with women in law. I had to start by hashtag me too. Sorry. <laughs> hashtag ties up. Um, you know, it, it's a huge movement. And I, I joke because um, the pendulum has swung. And as a female, I need to say a few things. I'm a feminist. I believe in equal rights for women. 
and I'm shocked that there's some people that don't, um, although they may not admit it, but I'm shocked if there's people that don't. I think that in certain situations, um, I, I feel a little bit badly for, for some of my male friends, and they can't say anything, so I will say it for them, but there's, there's certain situations now where uh, males feel very uncomfortable with their actions towards women, in, and not in a good way. So if they compliment a colleague on, you know, new shoes, or they hug a colleague after that they haven't seen for a long time, uh, that you know, genuinely nice gestures. Are they? Is someone going to come after them after the fact? Is someone going to say something when that colleague lawyer is now a politician and there's a picture hugging some female friend? <laughs> You know, and it's it's sad that uh, that there's people are taking advantage of of what is supposed to be such a great movement. Um, so there, to my male friends, I've said something for you. <laughs> um, but you know, when we go back to women in the law, uh, we have an unfortunate situation here. We've got over 50% or 50% of lawyers who enter the legal profession at this point are female. But when we look at the numbers, the retention rate. There's a huge, huge drop off with the women that remain in this profession. And I don't think that what I'm saying should come as a shock to anyone. I really think that people are aware of this fact. Um, we've got a statistic of 24% of partners in Ontario are female. 31% of sole practitioners in Ontario are female. Um, we've got, if you, if you look at the slide also, we've got female uh, lawyer membership is at 43.8% in Ontario. Female paralegal membership is at 63.9% in Ontario. We'll talk about the maternity benefits in a minute, but um, what is happening here? Why do we have 50% of lawyers uh, that enter the profession being female, but we only have 24% of partners in Ontario are female when there's 43% of lawyers, um, you know, that are in our membership? What is where? Where's the disconnect here? Someone has to notice there's a problem here. And, and you know, these stats, well, at least um, in terms of entry and partnership and, and drop-off as their, their careers progress, is um, not dissimilar to what's happening in the States because the American Bar Association uh, did a study a few years ago and it's shocking to me how similar the stats are, right? And so um, I know that the Law Society recognized uh, a few years ago that there was a problem and in 2008 uh, uh, they um, consulted with various stakeholders um, to look at um, uh, uh, the issue of the retention of women in in private um, practice and um, they uh, had a working group and um, ultimately I think in 2013 or 20. 14, there were about 75 law firms that had signed on to participate and they developed, uh, they, they, they decided that they were going to develop and track um, gender demographics. Now, if you speak to some people who were on the working group, and one of them was my, uh, is my friend, they'll say that the, 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 the way that the stats are being tracked is not necessarily um, that transparent, but um, in any event, um, the the notion was also to help firms develop um, flexible work arrangements for women because I think Jasmine has um, indicated in the materials and and um, you see it's, uh, work life balance is a big issue um, for women, especially um, when you start they start to have children. But you know so. Um, uh, also part of the the thing was to help um, women develop networks, um, help with business development, mentoring, and, and leadership skills. And, and those things, I see that the Law Society and others are, are trying to tackle, but still, since 2000, we have these stats, right? So, yeah, yes, these what is recent. happening? <laughs> these are recent statistics, and um, I, I just want to tell people a little bit about myself and my personal story. So I have three kids, um, six, eight, and 13. I know, it's shocking. Uh, even to me, my son, my 13-year-old is my height. I think he's actually a little taller than me, but I wear heels. So, um, <laughs> so he's, uh, yeah, he's catching up. But it's, it's not easy. It's, a, it's, a, it's definitely a juggling act. And 
Um, my husband is oftentimes not happy with me, uh, but I am in this in these stats. You know, I my class, my graduating class had 50 percent of females. I think actually I was at Queens, and I, I'm pretty sure that we had more than 50 percent female um, female uh, law grads from our class. And I fit into this statistic of I did make partners, so I'm in the low statistic of 24% of partners, and that was a few years ago. And now I'm in the sole practitioners, the 31%. And, and while that's commendable for me personally, that's not great for women, you know, and I think that needs to be recognized. And going back to myself, um, I, I really want to encourage women out there uh, by looking at me you know, if, if you drive anything, recognize for me that it's very possible. You know, if you want a career in law, you don't have to choose having children or a career. You can do both. And it's incredibly satisfying. In fact, on Sunday, I'm very happy to come back to my job. <laughs> I love my kids. On Friday, I'm very excited. By Sunday, I'm very happy. So that's just me personally. But um, I, I adore them. And, you know, my day job, um, makes me who I am. It, uh, I feel that it, it makes me a better mom. That's just me. But I feel that I appreciate my time so much more with my children uh, because I have something for myself. Um, uh, as I said, my husband, I'm not sure how happy he is, but, uh, <laughs> you know, he's, he's a wonderful, supportive man, supportive of my career, but uh, there's daily stress. And I think when we look at the Law Society Working Group report and you know, when they said work-life balance is the main issue, I agree. I recognize it. No one says it's easy. Um, it's definitely difficult. So I wake up every day really excited to come to the office and at the same time really stressed. And it's, it's a daily thing. I don't know a day where I haven't felt a combination of those two feelings. So, so if I could just quickly circle back and hopefully with the new um, uh, attempt in terms of the cultural shift in and the um, encouraging or requiring law firms to adopt a diversity inclusion measure, which includes um, gender and, 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 and ensure that women are, are mentored and sponsored. We'll see a change in the, the, the stats. We'll see as the, the law society moves forward whether or not those, these stats change because um, clearly, um, uh, nothing much is new since um, the Justicia project in 2008 in terms of the steps. Has it moved more quickly? So we're going to uh, just cruise through some of the statistics quickly. Um, we've got statistics on race since 2001. The proportion of racialized licensees in Ontario more than doubled, rising from 9% in 2001 to 20.8% 20, 20 in 2016. Um, you know, it's, it's good, but is this representative of our society? Well, well that's so, the question. And uh, it, well, it's, it's generally moving in the right direction, and that's good because of uh, the question that Jasmine asked, because um, you have to be representative of the society and the people we serve, and we're in the service industry, right? Yeah. So moving in the right direction in any event. Um, we've got a statistic on disability, so three 0.6% of all lawyers declared having a disability. Um, you know, what are we doing to support these individuals? Um, and, you know, with the requirements of the, uh, the AODA uh, Accessibility and um, Disabilities Act um, requirements, hopefully um, um, that will help, but I can tell you because I get a lot of emails from the AODA because my mom had a uh, disability and it, and it seems as if um, they're not happy with the government's response in, and um, addressing um, uh, these issues. And I can, I, I can only speak for um, one friend of mine who uh, I, I know um, had a hearing impairment and required accommodation at meetings and so on, and she's a champion of, of people with um, disabilities. And I, I, we haven't gone far enough. We haven't even begun to scratch the surface, right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> we look at the LGBTQ community. Now it says 3.5% identified 
but this has to be people that actually say something or tick that box. So is it fair to say that the number is probably higher? Probably. Yeah. I mean, no way to I've, know, but yeah. I would think given what we know about some people feeling uncomfortable in our profession about opening up about their sexual orientation, I think that the number might be higher. I would agree with that. Um, there are additional Law Society resources available. Uh, we've listed them all for you. They're all available online. So if you have any questions or um, anything you want to look into further, I would recommend that you go to these sites. And, and, and we know that the resources are, are focused on gender as opposed to anything else, and we recognize that, but the Law Society um, does have um, tremendous resources. And, you know, um, if you do have uh, any questions, I'm sure uh, after the webinar and once you get your little packet and you've de not deleted it, then you can, can always reach out to us. <laughs> Uh, I did miss one thing, and um, if we could just circle back, it again is mentioned here, the Parental Leave Assistance Program. So the Law Society of Ontario and the Law Society of British Columbia are the only provincial regulators to offer any maternity-related assistance. Does that surprise you? I mean, in Canada? Um, well, um, I, when, I, when I read that, I was actually surprised because I do know that they, they're trying to work towards a national parental leave um, policy um, to um, um, ensure that um, this is something that's national. And so I'm not, uh, I'm surprised that, that, that uh, it's only um, still, still Ontario and BC. So I'm not sure why there is, there's this log jam. So um, just if you're interested to know, in Ontario, it is a maximum of $9,000 if the lawyer's net practice income is less than $50,000 annually. So that's what they would get. Uh, it says no lawyer can provide legal services for such a low salary. Uh, so what are they supposed to do with that? I don't know. Assistance is only available to sole practitioners or someone in a firm of five lawyers or less, and the applicant cannot have entered into the federal EI special benefits program or be receiving any private maternity benefits. The Law Society states the lawyer must, quote, cease to engage in remunerative, remunerative work and to practice law while receiving benefits. And so maybe that's why uh, uh, that explains why only 22 women received the assistance in um, 2017 yeah. with those um, uh, criteria or restrictions, I should say. Uh, in BC, there's a maximum interest-free loan of up to 8000 which must be repaid within four years. Um, it says, similarly to Ontario, assistance is only available to sole practitioners or firms of up to five lawyers. Applicants must not have access to any maternity benefits beyond that of government programs. That tells you a little bit about the program. Um, the one thing we haven't uh, discussed yet is the catalyst report that crops up a lot. There's a lot of statistics in that report, and in fact, a lot of our statistics that uh, you saw in our presentation today were from that report. Audrey, tell us about the Catalyst Report. I don't know anything about the Catalyst Report. <laughs> I'm looking at my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that was our inside joke. And I asked her something, and she didn't know. She was going to look at her shoes, but I told her I would call her out, so she called herself out. Um, okay, so the Catalyst Report is a report that's available online, and there's a lot of statistics there about the different groups that we've talked about. Uh, if you are interested to know more, uh, feel free to review that report. Um, finally, in closing, um, I was wondering if Audrey can tell us a little bit about her firm and anything that her firm is doing um, to, some, uh, to support the promotion of equality, diversity, and inclusion. So maybe we can take away from that. Well, um, that's actually an interesting question because um, being a firm of over 10 licensees, we were required to have a diversity um, and inclusion policy before the end of the um, annual, uh, whatever, um, dead, deadline for uh, um, 2017 and, um, and filing by March. And uh, so 
so I was responsible for, for putting that together. Um, and uh, one of the things I did do, though, is go around and, 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 and speak to lawyers about what they were involved in outside of the traditional um, associations like the Ontario Bar Association or the Canadian Defense Lawyers. Uh, because if you look at the law society requirement, like they want us to network with other communities and other diverse associations. And so I was surprised to hear um, what a rich um, tapestry uh, of, of talent and, 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 and um, involvement we had in the firm without even knowing it because we don't really speak to each other about, about that. But um, uh, yeah, so uh, we're, we're, we're moving ahead with respect to the requirements of the law society, but I can tell you, uh, yeah, there are the people who thought, why are we doing this? And why do I have to do a statement of principles and, and, um, and so on? But um, it, it's a lot of work, um, but, uh, and I can tell you that there are people who say, well, look at our firm, why do we need uh, diversity and the inclusion policy. We we just are. We don't we hire people based on their merit and talent and what and look at us. And and I mean I, I think gut check that's probably um a great to, to see that yes yeah, by default you probably do it without even realizing <laughs> it. But but um it's it's still an important um discussion to have and especially as I, I see, like in terms of the balance of, of gender and in terms of the, the balance of, of um, diverse lawyers, like we, we've hit all the, the, the measures, but uh, it's by default, it's not conscious, but at least now we know, like we can look outside our traditional um, means of recruiting and so on. Um, and when we consider mentoring and sponsoring um, people as they go through um, and article and practice, we can think about whether or not uh, how it is we distribute work and, and how it is that we, we, um, we um, encourage lawyers as they, they move through instead of doing it um, ad hoc. Um, you know, you've got to invest some time, right? Does your office, your firm, have a, any manuals or guidebooks or have you started working on these things? Uh, we have, and we had to because of the uh, the law society requirement. We do have an HR manual, and because of the law society um, requirement that we have a diversity and inclusion um, policy, we've also adopted um, and, and, and uh, rejigged and, and to cre uh, adopted slash <laughs> Region slash created a diversity and inclusion uh, policy manual as well. That's good. It sounds like your firm's ahead of the game over here. <laughs> well, we're, it's, we we have. I'm um, being honest to say that there's a lot that that has to happen, and in and in terms of um, uh, the requirements to to give um, a fee, uh, to to meet with um, licensees to give feedback to to um, ensure that um, things are transparent, where those are things that are being implemented that have not existed before we've just <laughs> gone along. Mm -hmm. And by, I guess, by bringing things out in the open, by making it transparent, like people know, like what are my chances of making partner or not? And, you know, and, and uh, how can you help me? And, and um, uh, they're, they're, we're supposed to devote resources Mm -hmm. to diversity and inclusion and then show that right yeah. so the law society yes they're they're a regulator then they're making sure that firms make an investment mm -hmm. so I, I just want to share what my firm is doing because my firm is smaller and um, I, I think it's important to recognize that while we don't have a guidebook or a manual and I don't think I'll be making one right now. <laughs> we do have a policy, and it is, it's not, it's not that everyone knows it's, it's a policy, but what happens is I meet with people in my office and chat with people in my office regularly, and I send emails out every once in a while when there's office drama and explain the importance of having a firm family 
and treating each other with respect and embracing our differences and making people aware that if they have any issue with anyone for any reason in this office, then they need to talk to me, to the office manager, to whoever they feel comfortable with uh, so that they, that issue can be addressed. And that's a that's a, a good um, way to to go. We do have a a, a a diversity and inclusion committee, but that committee didn't deal with a recent issue that we had where someone said the N word, and I think it was um, accidental. I've never had that happen before, um, but it was said to an assistant, and it was said by someone else who was actually diverse to this mm -hmm. this person, and um, we uh, we dealt with it by that uh, having a discussion and 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 uh it was amazing because the, the person who was the the subject of the the um comment um thought that this other person did not understand what that expression meant and mm -hmm. it was but it was good to have a discussion yeah i think right? it goes a long way to have open dialogue and um you know i'm proud to say that my office represents the un <laughs> i look for competence i look for uh, personality and professionalism and i'm race blind and gender blind so yeah. with that uh, i think we will conclude our webinar and uh, thank you audrey for joining us at an otla based webinar today thank my, you. my pleasure thank you thank you jasmine and audrey that was a great presentation for more information on our webinars and see what else we have to offer please visit otla.com slash calendar or click calendar under the CLE and events tab of our main menu on otla.com. On behalf of our presenters and the Ontario Trial Lawyers Association, thank you for joining us. Have a great day.